At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce the uh, experts panel for the Q&A with the experts. Our first panelist is Director of Personal Finance for Morningstar and Senior Columnist for Morningstar.com. She is the author of 30-Minute Money Solutions, a step-by-step -step guide to managing your finances. She's also co-author of Morningstar's Guide to Mutual Funds, Five Star Strategies for Success, a national bestseller. Before assuming her current role in 2008, she also served as Morningstar's Director of Mutual Fund Analysis. She served as editor of several of Morningstar's publications over the years, including Practical Finance, Morningstar Mutual Funds, and Morningstar Mutual Fund Investor. She has worked as an analyst and editor at Morningstar since 1993. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science and Russian East European studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please welcome Christine Benz. Our next panelist is a retired neurologist who helped co-found Efficient Frontier Advisors. He's written several titles on finance and economic history. Although his early formative training in economics was confined to brief stints in the U.S. Postal Service during Christmas breaks, <laughs> his two finance books, The Intelligent Asset Allocator and Four Pillars of Investing, as well as the content on his website, EfficientFrontier.com, have made him uncomfortably popular among the financial press. He's also a big believer in the value of creative nonfiction process. During the past seven years, he's written two volumes of economic history, The Birth of Plenty and A Split Exchange. His latest book, The Investor's Manifesto, has turned out to be another winner. He holds both a PhD in chemistry and an MD. Please welcome one of the smartest guys I know, Dr. Bill Bernstein. Our next panelist is without a doubt one of the very best contributors to our forum and to the Bogleheads community. In recognition of her value to the Bogleheads community, Taylor and I crowned her the Queen of the Bogleheads at Die Hard 6 in DC four years ago so that she could take her rightful place as one of the recognized leaders of the Bogleheads community. She joined Rick, Taylor, and I on the book committee on the new Bogleheads Guide to Retirement Planning. She's also a Forbes columnist and shares the writing duties with me for our bi-weekly, the Bogleheads View column. Please welcome our queen, Laura. <laughs> our next panelist is the CEO of Portfolio Solutions, a low-cost investment management firm. He earned a BS in business administration from the University of Rhode Island and a master's in science in finance from Walsh College. He also holds the prestigious Charter Financial Analyst designation. He's written five books on low-cost investing, including All About Index Funds and All About Asset Allocation. His ETF <laughs> book is considered by many to be the Bible in the industry. He was a member of the book committee on the Bogleheads Guide to Retirement Planning, and his latest book, The Power of Passing, Passive Investing, has received wide acclaim. And if that's not enough, He's also a Forbes columnist. Please welcome Rick Ferry. Our next panelist is the founder of Wealth Logic, an hourly based financial planning and investment advisory firm that advises clients with portfolios ranging in size from $10,000 to $50 million. Uh, he's mocked on a, re a fairly regular basis by some financial pro professionals for his hourly fee business model and its obvious inability to make him rich. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the author of How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street and he writes the Irrational Investor blog at cbsmoneywatch.com. He teaches behavioral finance at the University of Denver and is an adjunct faculty member at Colorado College. He has a lot of meaningful credentials after his name. He's a CFP, a CFA, and an MBA, but claims he can still keep investing simple. His goal is never to be confused with Jim Cramer. Please welcome Alan Roth. And as I said, Bill Schultz.
Tice was scheduled to be with us, but he couldn't make it. So we've uh, several questions from attendees and uh, from the forum. So let's get right to it. We have a question. When, when I call a question from the attendee, if they would stand up just so that we know who you are and we can re uh, respond to you. Uh, this is from Bob, uh, also known as Shellcroft, Bob Shell. Bob asks, the amount of national debt in several nations, Iceland, Greece, Italy, and Ireland as examples, has become so serious that unpopular austerity measures have been implemented to calm lenders, stabilize and reduce debt, and avoid more financial crisis. With so many countries confronting these same and very large debt problems, what is your view, what in your view are investors in U.S. equity index funds and investors in international equity index funds likely to experience in terms of volatility and returns over the next 10 years? Simple question. <laughs> All right, we'll start with, uh, uh, on the end, we'll start with Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Rick told me to, to make sure Alan answered all the questions. So <laughs> yeah, Alan and Christine have to answer all the questions today. Um, what does it mean in terms of volatility? Yeah, there's going to be more volatility, but that means that there's also going to be less people investing in equity, so there'll be a higher risk premium paid to the people who hang in there. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the risk premium on U.S. equity anyway, particularly large cap U.S. equity, is going to be higher than uh, what it's been, and I'm, I'm estimating that the uh, equity risk premium is going to be about a 6% over the next decade or so, maybe even a little higher than that, the large cap U.S. equity. Internationally, it might be a little bit lower. I think that a lot of money went into emerging markets and it might have been uh, too much money going in there. Uh, I think Europe's going to take a while to resolve their issues. So I think the, I'm not a market timer, okay? But <laughs> I can have an opinion, just like everybody else, in my opinion, uh, the U.S. Uh, equity risk premium is going to be uh, good. It's going to be a little bit higher than average uh, over the next decade. That's my opinion. Alan, any thoughts? Does, does it seem like the market is much more volatile today? Yeah. yeah. Well, I just looked it up. You know, uh, Wilshire gave me some great data. The monthly standard deviation of the last 10 years is 4.7 percent. The previous 30 years was 4.6 percent. <laughs> a tiny bit more volatile, perhaps more volatile on a daily basis. But today we have sovereign nations. What was that? We have sovereign nations that that can go under. You know, this time it's different. The last time it was different, and the next time it will be different. Capitalism will survive. Yeah, I, I largely agree with what Rick and Alan said, but I, I might make the case that I think that foreign stocks, particularly European stocks, are even more attractively priced right now. It is not difficult to find uh, continental European stocks selling at single-digit multiples. I don't know what the PE of you know the European index fund is, but it's probably fairly close to 10 right now. Dividend yield fairly close to 4%. Uh, and, you know, that's discounted a fair amount of bad news, which is pretty much constant with what, with what, uh, with what Rick said. Um, I, I almost think that emerging markets now are almost becoming fairly valued once, once again. Um, when I get asked by professional audiences what I think of emerging markets, I say the wonderful thing about them uh, is that from time to time they can become really cheap. Uh, and, and, and I think that's that's about to happen. I'll ask Rick one question, though, which is that in order to see um, an equity risk premium of 6%, are you expecting more price falls to get there, or do you think we're there already? More what to get there? In other words, in other words you're, you're, you're predicting that an equity risk premium of 6% or about on U.S. equities. Do you think we're there already, or do you think the price is going to have to fall to get there? No, I think we're there. Uh, I think we're there, and the way I, I calculate it is um, now, this is before inflation, so it's a real equity risk premium, and you have to add an inflation rate on top of this. So I'll get to that in a minute. But right now we have S&P paying 2.1, 2.2% dividend. Uh, 
if dividends are reinvested, there's actually a compounding effect that takes place over a 10-year period of time. So in fact, dividend yield over a 10-year period of time would be more like 2.5. So there's 2.5 from dividend payments. GDP, real GDP, is, uh, is basically the growth of earnings in a very simplified way. And so let's say that real GDP is below normal GDP in this new normal phase that we have. And so add two and a half percent for GDP growth over a 10-year period. That gets you to five. Unlike Jack, I, I think that the market is discounted uh, quite a bit based on the risk off trade that a lot of investors are doing. And I think the PE multiple of the market is actually going to expand as opposed to contract. So instead of taking off one like Jack did, I'm actually adding one saying that the PE of the market is going to go from 12 to perhaps 15, which would be a normal PE over a long-term period of time, about 15 or 16. And if we get that multiple expansion on equities up to 15 or 16 over the next 10 years, you add another 1%. So it is 2.5 uh, from dividends, 2.5 from GDP growth, 1% from uh, multiple expansion up to a normal 15 or 16. Um, and then you add on whatever inflation is, so 2% inflation. So that's 6% there, and you add on 2% 2, 2 for inflation to get to 8. I, I might add I love the new normal, uh, because the new normal was a phrase coined by the, by the geniuses at PIMCO huh. in, in April or May of 2009. Uh, so you know, that was a great call if there ever was one. Uh, and you know, low economic growth means low share dilution. Uh, it means high buybacks. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a bad thing for, uh, for the owners of common shares. Well, one point I would make, I was out at Vanguard yesterday afternoon before everyone else got there and um, sitting down with some people in their portfolio construction group, um, the folks who do research on issues such as asset allocation and so forth. And they've got um, a really compelling paper where they've looked at the, the connection between economic growth and market performance and found almost no correlation. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a, a good message for anyone who's looking at um, compelling growth in emerging markets, weak growth in developed markets, and attempting to make portfolio decisions based on that. What they found is that um, there really isn't a lot of connection. So I know that it's tempting to pay attention to the headlines, certainly um, keep an eye on economic news just for our own lives, but just in terms of predicting market performance, it's um, maybe not something that you want to use to adjust your portfolio. Okay, the next question is from Lady Geek. Uh, she will preface it with uh, the comment that this thread uh, this subject has over 31,000 views in a six-week period and contains one of the most intensely argued topics I've seen in quite a while. Can we continue this discussion with the panel? And the answer is yes. So she said, with regard to a forum discussion on Trinity study authors update their results, in which Bill Bernstein contributed a few comments, the first question is, does anyone on the panel recommend changing their target safe withdrawal rate different than the recommended 4%. For example, should one plan to vary their withdrawal rates as necessary? Uh, I'll come on, on that first, and I'm sure everybody will have something to say, but I think it's ridiculous to think that at some point in time, when we retire at 65, that we are going to set a number that can't be changed. I mean, we've adapted all of our life and adjusted all of our life to situations and to think that we are never going to make any adjustments once we set this 4% uh, withdrawal rate uh, uh, adjusted for inflation is, to me, it's ridiculous. So. Mel, I'll, I'll just respond. I agree with you um, in general, although I recently had, uh, probably a year ago, I talked to Harold Domensky. Some of you may know him. He's a noted financial planner. And I discussed this question of, um, perhaps adjusting with withdrawal rates to reflect um, market action, so, so bringing withdrawal rates down at certain points in time. And he said, from a practitioner's standpoint, he said, unfortunately, sometimes when you're asking retirees to do that, you're asking them to cut out the things that are their real quality of life items. So going out to dinner, going to the movies. 
And so he said, you know, it makes all the sense in the world if you have it on paper, but from a practitioner's standpoint, it can be very difficult to tell people to cut back on certain things that are really contributing to their quality of life in their later years. You want to comment? Did you comment on the form? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I really don't think uh, that I changed my, my view. Um, you know, to me, the guidelines, 2%, what we like to tell people is that, you know, 2% is, bull 2 is bulletproof, 3% is probably safe, 4% you're starting to take chances, and 5% you're eating alpo. <laughs> um, and and I, I really, you know, I, I, I think that the value of that sort of paradigm is simply a reality check for people in the saving phase to let them know that, you know, you've only saved, you know, five times or 10 times, um, your annual uh, living expenses, you're nowhere near done with the job. Um, about two years ago, I did a Monte Carlo simulation for an article I did for Money Magazine, and I felt really good about the simulation because I ran the results by Bill Bernstein, who agreed. <laughs> you may not remember. Um, but uh, the 4%, I believe, is a theoretical safe withdrawal rate. It assumes a portfolio, in my model, of a 50-50 low-cost index funds with annual rebalancing. Mm -hmm. What I also did is I looked at what would the safe return for the average investor who pays the penalty for expenses and pays the 1.5% penalty for emotions. Mm -hmm. Gold, you know, going into whatever is hot. <clears throat> and what I found was that the safe withdrawal rate for the average investor paying average expenses and having average emotions is only about two and a half percent. I always like to look at a safe withdrawal rate as whatever the cash flow is that's coming off of your portfolio. So if stocks are paying a little over two percent, bonds with a combination of uh, uh, total bond market and some high yield. Uh, you can actually bump it up to over 4%, so 2.5 and, and 4. So I look right now at the safe withdrawal rate of about 3.5. I mean, it would be 4, except that the Fed is kind of getting in the way of this because they're artificially lowering uh, treasury bond rates, which are part of the aggregate bond market. So you're getting less from the aggregate bond market than you really should be as far as the yield. Uh, but so right now, my quote unquote safe withdrawal rate, if you and I agree with Alan, it, it is a theoretical number. I mean, uh, the, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that you, need, you should be looking at this as, is this the only amount of money you should be taking out of your portfolio? Because I'm also under the belief that you're not going to live forever. Do you want your kids to inherit every dime of principal you currently have now on an inflation-adjusted basis? Or they get what's left? <laughs> uh, and, and you really have to take those things into consideration to determine you know, your, your, your longevity and, and how much you want to leave to the kids when you die, and the fact is, and I've been saying this for a long time, you don't spend as much money when you're 90 years old as you do when you're 65 on an annual basis. So uh, you have this uh, flattening spending curve that happens, and it's actually what I've seen with my grandparents and my parents is a decreasing spending later on in life as you get up into your 80s because you don't take as many vacations, you don't have two cars, you might sell the vacation home. Uh, and all these things happen later on in life where your cash flow going out just gets down to your basic living expenses and that's it. So you put all these things together in a formula and the question is what is your safe withdrawal rate starting at age 65? It might be higher than 3.5%. I always say spend a little more when you're 65 because you're not going to be able to spend it when you're 95. And uh, that's, that's my view on this, this picture. So I like the Trinity study, I've seen so many financial planners uh, that, that look at that and say, you need to cut out your magazine subscriptions because you're not going to have enough money to live on when you're you know, 113 years old. <laughs> yeah, and I just don't buy it. So I think it's like much more to that than just, than just that mathematical number. Well, a couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, first of all, the Trinity study shows what worked in the past. There's no guarantee uh, that that's going to work in the future. The second thing is, is that the Trinity study survival rates uh, use a lot more equities in their portfolios than some uh, retirees want to hold. So uh, the other thing to address the point that Rick talked about was uh, 
that mentioned you don't spend as much when you're older as you do when the early years of retirement. But uh, I would say that I would disagree that some people are going to have to spend a lot more because they're going to go in long-term care and uh, or assisted living. And that is very, very expensive. And I can tell you my father, who is 96, is spending an awful lot of money in uh, assisted living. So that's something to keep in mind. But he has you, Mel. <laughs> serious about this. For the, one, for the one piece of equity that a lot of people who have children never take into consideration is the fact that they have children. And uh, their children have done very well, and their children are not going to eat, let them eat dog food. Uh, I mean, whether you like it or not, the, the, the backup for America is, is the next generation, the children who are going to help support the parents if they need it. And I know it's never counted in all these formulas, but it exists. You're not going to let your father get thrown out into the street. You kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to comment also. I think that the uh, something like the Trinity study is useful for uh, people who are not yet uh, retired. Also, it's just a planning tool, sort of a target to think about. Um, and, you know, none of us know what the future is going to bring. But if you're trying to figure out as you approach that date, when can I retire, you've got to have something to sort of give you a feel for that. Part of that is sort of whatever your current expenses, what you sort of being able to project ahead. Um, but the farther out you are, you know, the rougher that number is going to be. And that, I think, is a very good way to, to do that. So if you can aim, you know, when you're in your 20s and 30s to try and hit a 2% rate, you know, to cover your living expenses, I think that you're going to be in much better shape than if you're, you know, planning for 7% or 8% or, or whatever it is. So I just find it useful as a tool. It depends, again, like many things in finance, where you are, what stage in life you are, and where you are in this withdrawal process or still uh, contributing. I just want to amplify briefly on, on what Mel said about the study, uh, about the Trinity study, which is that it's used, it used historical returns with a abnormally high equity risk premium, the sort we're not going to see for a long time. Uh, and so, you know, they, they recognize that. I know Wade Fowl, he redid the study on my, my suggestion in a number of different countries, including Japan, obviously. Uh, in most other countries, it comes out much more friendly. But there's another aspect to that study which very few people comment on, and is, it's always useful to keep in mind, which is that it almost between about 75% equity and 25% equity, in other words, between 25-75 and 75-25, the survival rates were almost the same. So what that says is it almost really, within reason, um, your equity exposure doesn't matter that much to your survival. Uh, probability. Uh, what matters is that you keep your discipline. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I see from a lot of clients coming in, mistakes that they've made, is chasing income. I'll have people that come in with portfolios yielding six, seven, eight percent, and I look at the total return, and it has been quite negative. So looking at your total return versus income is important. Don't buy Greek bonds and assume you can have a 65% safe withdrawal rate. <laughs> <laughs> the second part of the question is, which is the better approach for analysis, Monte Carlo or historical data? <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> You have to look at historical data to try to come up with what your expectations of returns are in the markets. And I don't mean just doing a, a, a naive look back and say, well, the return of the equities have been this, the return of bonds have been that, therefore that's what it's going to be going forward. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, people who are in this business, that's what they do. And of course, they have terrible, erroneous expectations of return. I, I agree with Laura. I mean, it, it's more than that. It's more, it, it's neither. It's neither Monte Carlo and it's neither um, historical numbers. I mean, it's more common sense, or I don't know what you want to call it, but it's not, uh, it's, it's no hard and fast way. I'm a strong believer in Monte Carlo simulation. And in 2008, Monte Carlo simulation got bashed. And it wasn't the Monte Carlo simulation, it was the incredible assumptions that went into it. I saw advisors using well, the stock market's going to yield this, I'm more brilliant, I'm going to add 2% alpha, I'll know when to get out, let's make the standard deviation of the stock market you know, 8%. So you put garbage in a good model and you're going to get garbage out. You have to use history to come up with the assumptions. You have to use common sense 
coming in with the Monte Carlo simulation. Um, using history alone, um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism that I think is just on Jeremy Siegel's 200 years of uh, history. We really only have, since 1926, really good, reliable data on the stock market. So Monte Carlo simulation with real assumptions and common sense. And the final part of the question, is the life cycle finance approach anything new? I'm not quite sure. That sounds like a financial planner question to me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what the question really is, so hopefully Rick or... Uh, Susan, what did you mean? I meant it's part of that Trinity thread. They were throwing up different approaches to come up with a number, and they somebody at the end threw in life cycle finance as a way, as a Monte Carlo historical, and then it got uh, discussed rather thoroughly as, as part of, I thought it was part of the problem to come up with the safe withdrawal rate, but maybe they were going a little bit off. So maybe it was a, a subtle discussion on something else inside that thread. That's so easy, I'm going to let Rick in. No, I'm right. <laughs> I really am not sure what. To... Alan, you're the new guy in the panel. <laughs> Christine, too. There you go. Christine, lately, so. Let Mikey do it, Alan. <laughs> All right, the next question is uh, from. Ken Bear, did you did anybody want to address that or did they understand what the question is? It was I don't know. discarded then, maybe it wasn't. Okay. Uh, from Ken Bennett, it says uh, the question is a general question for the panel. Currently, I'm 10 years away from retirement and hold approximately three months of salary in an emergency fund. What is the recommended time frame for increasing the amount of cash in reserves, and how much should I plan on having in that account at retirement? So in other words, I think the, the question is, is that while he's working, he has a three-month emergency supply. Now he needs a cash reserve to live on. Uh, when should he start increasing the uh, uh, account so that at retirement he has uh, what would be considered sufficient funds in cash? Tomorrow, <laughs> I agree. Three, 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 I, I, three, three months of living expenses would, would scare the jobbers out of me. Uh, I mean, unless you have really, 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 really good disability insurance. Uh, that's what I was thinking too, Bill. And um, one thing I've been talking about, though, since yields on CDs and money markets and everything else are just about as low as they're going to go, I've been talking about the idea of building a two-part emergency fund. So one three-month chunk that consists of true, true cash and then maybe another portion that consists of a short-term bond fund with some potential for principal fluctuation, but you have that truly cash piece um, for immediate needs. So my thought is for most people, they want to nudge that emergency fund out a little bit. They can, can do that as long as they do have a piece carved in cash. And then in terms of enlarging that, I usually um, uh, say that retirees should come into retirement with about two years worth of living expenses in, in true cash. Um, I, I'm sure some others on the panel feel differently. And my bias would be to sort of gradually enlarge that rather than doing that, um, you know, just as you are approaching retirement. Yeah, I was actually going to say exactly the same thing. I think now is the time to start with that on a gradual basis because if you're 10 years out, then you've got plenty of time to sort of slowly build up that cash balance. But I also agree that three months would make me extremely nervous. If that's, uh, I mean, unless you've got really, really, really solid you know, employment and disability insurance and perhaps your portfolio was already large enough that if you suddenly had to stop working tomorrow, it wouldn't be a big problem for you financially. I don't think I have one month worth of cash in my portfolio. With that said, I have what I call near cash. Um, and I've written about an Ally Bank CD that's yield, it's a five year CD, but it's yielding uh, about 2% now, and it has a, a 60 day early withdrawal penalty. So, in other words, after 60 days, I've earned at least as much as the 0.03% that the prime money market is paying. So, having near cash or access to cash via a home equity line of credit that the bank cannot cancel. Um, so having access to cash is more important than cash itself. Yeah, I, these are all good points. Uh, I, I agree with Christine that uh, my, in my own situation where I'm 53 and I'm uh, going to be working for another 10 years at least, uh, 
I have one year's worth of liquid assets set aside in a separate account, but it's divided into two buckets. I have a near-term liquid asset cash, which is actually just sitting in a money market, three months supply of that, but I have nine months supply of what, I, of what corporate America calls permanent liquid assets, which the, the liquid assets sometimes come down a little bit, so I might end up with a, a two months or something like that, but then I refund it and it goes back up to three. So that there's, there's different levels of money that you have in your uh, emergency fund where once you get past three months and you've got these other nine months there, these permanent liquid assets you can be more aggressive with. I have corporate bond funds in there, I even have some equity funds in there and uh, index funds, uh, equity. And I know that sounds strange to have equity in an emergency fund, but you know that's way down here at the bottom of my one year's worth of liquid, um, permanent liquid assets. So I've never had to touch it, and it's going to be a higher rate of return with better taxes because these are taxable accounts. Now, my plan is, personally, when I retire, whenever that is, at age 65 or whenever, uh, I'm going to have, as Christine suggested, two years of, uh, of liquid money in this account, so I'm going to increase it. may not have to increase it that much because probably my expenses might go down when I retire, but that's my plan, so I, I agree with uh, Christine. Yeah, I mean, you know, what you consider a liquid asset, I mean, you just have a nice range of opinions, and I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful exposition of it. Uh, you know, certainly I don't mean money markets or money stuff from the mattress. Uh, I would define cash as anything that at the end of the financial world you're not going to take more than a couple percent here at on. Uh, I wouldn't put corporate bonds in there, I would put short unis in there. I would certainly put CDs in there uh, as as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I certainly don't mean you have to have that much, you know, a year or two's worth of cash in a money market. Well, one of the things that I've long uh, uh, advocated is uh, an emergency fund or I-bonds. Uh, I-bonds, of course, once they get to the, the one year uh, spot, they're, they're like cash. And yet, if you don't need them, you're earning a, a very reasonable return, especially if you bought back when I told you about it. <laughs> <laughs> those, those puppies are yielding over 8% right now for those who didn't get them. But uh, the point is, is that there's so much flexibility once you get to the one-year spot that you can redeem them at any point. And yet, you're not suffering with low yields, uh, uh, and you're not... Uh, if you're in it for the long haul, you're not getting ravaged by inflation. So. Yeah, Mel, it's funny. I am working on a thread with some of our users on Morningstar.com in one of the retirement forums, and I asked them what their biggest surprises were in retirement, happy and otherwise, financial and otherwise. And a few posters said, thank God for those I-bonds. <laughs> and I think they actually tipped the hat to you guys for... Uh, <laughs> And don't forget Mel's unlovely uh, mid-cap secret. <laughs> okay, the next question. Uh, should tips be part of the portfolio of a younger person, say under 40? If so, how much of one's bonds should be in tips? Uh, I, I'm sure there's, there, there's a lot of different opinions on this, but basically, when you're working, you're... Uh, normally, your increases are going to your wage increases are going to help keep uh, uh, keep you up with inflation. Uh, so I don't think it's that important for a younger person, but I still it's still a good investment, and there's nothing to keep a young person from getting them. Uh, my bond portfolio is fixed. I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter if it if it's somebody who's in their 60s or somebody in their 20s is simply 60% of Vanguard aggregate bond market, total bond market. What's missing out of the Barclays uh, capital aggregate bond market are, are two asset classes. One of them are tips. Tips are not included in that. So if you wanted to have a total bond market, you would have to add tips. And the other side that's not included in that index is high yield corporate bonds. So if you wanted to have a total bond market uh, index, you have to actually include some high yield. Um, I, I put 20% in tips, 20% in high yield, 60% in the total bond market. It seems to, to work 
so that somebody who's young, even though they might only have 20% fixed income in their portfolio because they uh, have a lot of human capital in front of them in many years to work, uh, whatever that bond portion is, if they if it makes sense, because sometimes it doesn't make sense because they don't have a lot of money to to invest. But if it makes sense, like you know, I think a 20 20 60 strategy works has worked very well, and uh, it gives you a little bit of a hedge against unanticipated inflation. Inflation rate is in, inherent in all fixed income, um, including uh, uh, tips. What tips give you a hedge against is a jump in the unanticipated. Inflation, actual jump in inflation that nobody was expecting. I think we've been talking about between two and two and a half percent expected inflation over the long term. So if it jumps to five, it jumps to six, it jumps to seven, that's what your um, tips are going to give you that, that hedge. And so I think it's important to have some in a portfolio. I think this was addressed last night at uh, Vanguard too when they were discussing the makeup of the target retirement funds and why they did not include tips in the. Uh, the funds for the long-term funds and that they did include them in the uh, shorter-term funds. Yeah, um, I often look at the data that Ibbotson puts together on asset allocation and <clears throat> Ibbotson is under the Morningstar umbrella so I'm able to harness what they do and um, I believe that their tips allocations for retirement portfolios actually run as high as 30% of the fixed income portfolio and for younger investors it's more, um, more in the range of 20% of the fixed income portfolio. So it sounds like we're all kind of in the same general ballpark. I use behavioral finance as a reason to be a little bit active on tips. And I think that as humans, we tend to think in nominal terms rather than in real terms, inflation adjusted, that uh, matters. Um, in 2008, when the financial system was doomed, tips should have been the safest investment out there. And as Bill mentioned, they plummeted. Yields were up to three and a half, four percent. Boy, would I love to go back we there. Did. Yeah. Well, um, no, a lot of the bullheads did because that was pointed out. Yeah, and I did as well. But tips are yielding the, the, the I don't completely agree with you, Bill, on uh, tips funds. The, uh, the Vanguard uh, tip fund is now yielding CPI minus about 0.3 percent. So I've been taking some out of tips, which I believe in and moving into CDs. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, again, the question was addressed to the younger saver, as I, as I said with Jack earlier. Um, you know, I think that for the retired person, tips are wonderful because it allows them to be certain of their consumption ability, you know, five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years hence. But, but you know, I really got religion in 08, 09 about tips, and it made me think more clear, clearly about portfolio construction. For the young investor who is stock heavy, there are really only two asset classes. You've heard me say many times before, there's risky assets and there are riskless assets. And the riskless assets are there to help you sleep at night. They're there so that you can buy stocks when they're cheap. They're there so you can pay your living expenses when you lose your job. And they're there uh, for when your annoying neighbor with the corner lot you've had your eye on for the past 10 years suddenly needs liquidity. Okay, and you can you can be a nice guy and, and give it to them. And tips are neither fish nor fowl. Uh, you know they're not going to help you when you really 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 need them. And that's you know I think for the younger investor, I, I think that twenty percent of your bond portfolio is fine. I think zero percent is fine. Well, I think one thing that amazes me, Alan just touched on it, that the uh, tips and the tips funds are showing negative returns. But that's negative real returns. So people will sell tips and go buy a one, one and a half percent CD, which in reality has a negative return of 1.5%. So you, you need to think in terms of real return as opposed to uh, just looking at uh, the posted uh, real return that's on Vanguard and think that if you get more than 0.5, negative 0.58, that you're actually doing good. But people are looking at the nominal return and ignoring what their real return is. So what you really have to do is make sure that you try to convert the nominal into, into real and then compare apples to apples. Uh, the next question is for Willela. Am I pronouncing that correctly? 
She says, I sit on the board that oversees my employer's pension plan. The plan's expected uh, ROI over 10 years is 8%. I think, <laughs> I think this is too high, but the plan advisors don't. What does the panel think? Are there any uh, references or sources I can cite to make my case to the board? I, I think you need to check that your board members are still on their medications and, check <laughs> and, and, to, and, to, and to ask what they've been smoking. Uh, you know, if you have a typical 60-40 portfolio, the return of your bond, the real, well, the nominal expected return of your bond portfolio is 2 or 3 percent. Uh, and so to get to 8 percent, you have to assume a, an equity return of, I don't know, in the low teens. Um, good luck with that. Yeah, but all of the government pension funds are 8%, so why shouldn't I be? <laughs> That's all I'm using as a benchmark. I mean, I'm looking at what all the governments are saying is their expected rate of return, and obviously I'm as good of an investor as any state government. Therefore, <laughs> why shouldn't we use 8 on my foundation? I mean, I think that's the thinking. I would direct them to the state of Florida pension people. Aren't they the ones that keep losing hundreds of millions of dollars? <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of work with... Uh, somebody from the St. Petersburg Press on uh, the Florida State Pension Fund, and they're spending, well, what they're disclosing is they're spending four or five hundred million dollars a year on their hundred billion dollar fund, but they're not disclosing the hidden cost of uh, paying the hedge fund managers an incentive. They won't disclose that because they say it's confidential. But anyway, so uh, I think the 8% is clearly too high, as Bill said. I mean, realistically, 6% is a realistic number uh, to, to have on these, on these funds. And, and this 8% is simply to try to, from the pension fund side, is simply to not have to fund their liabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they say, well, we're, we're perfectly, you know, we're, we're well-funded here, or we're close to being well-funded because we're using such a high discount rate on our future liabilities, which is just completely unrealistic. It's going to bite them in the butt, but, you know, it makes... Politicians look good, balances the budget, so this is what they go with. And unfortunately, foundations then look at that and naively say, well, if this is what the state thinks they're going to get, then that's probably what we should use, but it's the wrong assumption. I think they call it kicking the can down the road. <laughs> it, it's reality versus politics, and politics always win. Rick, you hinted at uh, the presence of alternatives in a lot of these uh, pension accounts, and it's a good opportunity to check up on what exactly they've got in there, because I know in the state of Illinois, um, they have increasingly been shifting assets into alternative assets in an effort to goose their expected return. And I, I think we can all agree that there are great risks in doing so, and uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous trend.